So just, just tell me when we're live. We're good to go? Okay. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming tonight. And thank you, uh, everyone who's joining us through the live stream. Uh, my name is Scott Klinker. I head the 3D design program. Uh, uh, and um, we have a very special event tonight, uh, the annual Miller Knoll Lecture on Design, uh, formerly known as the Knoll Lecture on Design. Knoll merged with Herman Miller this year uh, to become um, Miller Knoll. Uh, the, this lecture on design was established in 2003 to present a prominent designer at the academy through a public lecture and a visit with the students in the 3D uh, design department. Miller Knoll is recognized internationally as a manufacturer of workplace furnishings and a leader in sustainable design. Both Herman Miller and Knoll have their roots at Cranbrook. Florence Knoll, co-founder of the company, and her, uh, with her husband, Hans Knoll, uh, studied at both Kingswood School and Cranbrook Academy. An impressive list of Cranbrook designers have worked with Miller Knoll, including Charles and Ray Eames, Aero Saarinen, Harry Bertoya, Ralph Rapson, Marianne Stringell, Michael McCoy, and Hani Rashid, uh, and most recently, Masamichi Udagawa of Antenna Design, just to name a few. On behalf of the Academy, uh, I want to thank Miller Knoll for keeping a strong connection with Cranbrook uh, and for providing this opportunity to bring top designers here to give a public talk and to speak with our students. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, can you please help me thank Miller Knoll for their support? <laughs> Tonight's speaker is designer Stephen Hollenbeek. Stephen has earned a reputation in the world of collectible design for his use of materials and processes to invent new form languages. His techniques with ice cast bronze and resin bonded sand uh, have especially become synonymous with his personal signature. His works are currently represented uh, by Carpenter's Workshop Gallery uh, in New York City, along with some of the biggest names in contemporary collectible design. Stephen earned a graduate degree in designed objects at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in um, 2006, and in subsequent years, explored several models of practice as an industrial designer. In 2010, he began his independent practice, uh, Stephen Hollenbeek Design, with emphasis on unique material, material process-based objects for the home. In 2011, he created the first ice cast bronze objects util utilizing the frigid Chicago winter environment to create objects in cast bronze. His work runs the gamut in scale, material, and process, but all exhibit a similar understanding of materials and an, and an aesthetic uh, simplicity through a hands-on experimental prototyping style. Stephen has been gener generous enough to spend three days uh, with us uh, in a workshop focused on experimental approaches to materials, colors, and finishes with our 3D design students in the studio. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for a few days, and uh, please help me welcome designer Stephen Hollenbeek. Thanks, Scott, um, uh, for having me back for the second time, and uh, Thanks to Miller Knoll for uh, the support. Um, uh, yeah, the, the first time I was here, I, I think it was five or maybe six years ago now, um, I, I did kind of a deep dive into uh, the, uh, my, my background from, from the beginning and all the, the different recreations of my, um, my practice, my career, and, uh, um, and tonight, I want to talk a little bit more about my um, my current work and do a really deep in the weeds sort of dive into ice cast bronze and, and resin bonded sand and and follow a lot of the the tangents that I've uh, found myself on um, uh, working through these processes and um, continuing to experiment and and create um, new forms, new. Um, aesthetics, uh, categories of, of furniture, sculpture, other things. Um, but before I do, um, just a, a really brief history. Um, 
this is the, the sculpture studio at Hope College where I went in Holland, Michigan, um, 1998 to 2002. Um, and it wasn't until the second semester of my senior year um, that I got into to sculpture. I had been an artist my entire life. I was doing a lot of drawing, uh, mostly Spider-Man, things like that growing up. Um, but uh, uh, I was still pretty directionless um, even into my senior year of college, not really understanding like where my, my place was until I got into sculpture and I met uh, Billy Mayer, who was uh, my sculpture professor. Um, and he was an amazing sculptor and uh, just an even more amazing guy and uh, kind of a design buff also. So he started to um, give me some context uh, and tell me about, um, you know, these, these shell chairs that I had been sitting on my, my entire life um, and that they were significant. And uh, so I started to learn about Charles and Ray Eames and, um, and Bertoya and Saarinen and George Nelson and just realizing that I was sort of sitting right in the center of this, this hotbed of uh, American design. Um, and I, um, I started to get interested in being a furniture designer in all of my, you know, half a semester <laughs> left of, of college. Um, so I needed a little more time and uh, Billy allowed me to be a studio assistant and just come and go as I please and start to build a portfolio, which I, you know, went back to um, school uh, at the Art Institute eventually in Chicago. So this is 2004. Chicago. Um, this is uh, the uh, snowmageddon, the, the polar vortex of the winter of 2010 and 11. And um, so I went through a design objects program at the Art Institute, um, graduated in 2006. Um, I uh, bounced around a little bit. I moved to Atlanta for a little while. I worked as a uh, industrial designer for a company down there, which I enjoyed. Um, didn't really love uh, Atlanta, having grown up in the, the Midwest, and um, it was sort of like a culture or climate shock um, coming from this. And, um, and I ended up coming back home uh, to Chicago when I got a, a job at uh, Holly Hunt as a furniture designer. Um, so I, I finally got my, my wish. I um, achieved my goal. I was now a furniture designer like I wanted to be, and uh, I was um, completely miserable. <laughs> um, it, it was actually not miserable. I was, it, it was two and a half years, and I was let go in, at the end of 2010, uh, kind of when the economy was in the tank. And... Um, I was uh, kind of searching for the, the next thing. Um, so a former colleague of mine uh, coincidentally at the same time started or bought into a, a bronze foundry that um, had some orders from Holly Hunt and a uh, small place. And in return for me helping to, you know, clean the place out and um, just help around the shop a little bit, um, I could just kind of come and go as I please. So I got access to, you know, the, the foundry works, the wax pots and whatnot. Um, I had done a little bit of um, bronze work in, in uh, sculpture classes before, but didn't really get to ever dig into it. So um, started just doing my own research, my own experimentation, um, playing with wax and uh, it was at the same time that this happened, this, this incredible cold, you know, hit Chicago. People abandoned their cars. This is Lakeshore Drive um, and uh, took shelter. Um, there was like a good stretch of a couple weeks where it was like negative 14 degrees or something like that. Um, but anyways, I, I had um, this opportunity um, where I was... I was experimenting with wax. I knew that, you know, my little 
you know, knowledge of the ice or the um, lost wax process was that if I could create something interesting in wax, I could create something interesting in bronze. Um, so as one of many experiments, I just walked out the door into the cold with a little bit of um, hot casting wax in, uh, in a pitcher and I started to pour it on the ground. This is not a video of that actual first pour, um, but um, you can see the, the crazy way that the, you know, the uh, wax is moving on the surface of the ice. It, it's more, it felt more like a, like growth or something, like it was like crawling. Um, and uh, I didn't know what that meant and it, it just seemed really interesting and after picking the piece up it wasn't, um, it wasn't beautiful by any means, it looked like a cow patty or something. Um, but there was just enough information in that little piece of wax that I poured onto the um, frozen sidewalk um, to help me understand like what the next few experiments would be. So uh, I continued to you know show up late at night and play with wax. Uh, I would leave things outside, uh, freeze them, um, you know freeze buckets of water or uh, just you know, take a stainless steel I Ikea bowl or something and get it really cold. And I would pour into things and onto things and um, just see you know, what kind of texture uh, would occur um, and uh, just what I could get. Uh, so the first ice cast bronze pieces looked something like this. This isn't the very first, but this piece is about the size of a, a pint glass or something. Um, and I was, uh, so I, I took a block of ice, I chiseled just with hand tools, um, a cavity into the ice, and then I filled it full of wax, uh, hot casting wax, which is, you know, 225 to 250 degrees, something like that, um, and left it in that, uh, in that cavity and until the outer surface hardened against the ice, and then I would pour the liquid wax out from the inside, which would leave me this, you know, vessel form with uh, this textured outside. Um, and then we could easily, you know, take that piece through the lost wax process to uh, recreate that wax into bronze. Um, so I, this, these are my first experiments, uh, my first, you know, viable object. Uh, and I kind of kept, just going with it. Um, this piece, I think this was 2012, um, and this was a really pivotal uh, piece for me. Um, I started to refine the process and really understand it, and that you know I could I could carve that cabin in the ice, uh, pour the wax just the same, um, and then I realized that I could take ladles out of the inside to remove uh, the wax from the inside, which would leave me this nice little striation every time the level of the wax dropped. So uh, the interior of the vessel was, was you know, considered also. Um, and my timing, I was figuring out to get, you know, the proper thickness of this piece so it wasn't like a, you know, a massive amount of, of bronze. And the best part about it was these little uh, mushroom things or whatever that showed up on the outside. And this was uh, completely by chance. This is just kind of luck. Um, but it became, you know, the most important part of this piece as far as I was concerned. Um, and th this is what really got me thinking about um, this concept and kind of building uh, the story and how I would move forward with this body of work, which is um, that that, that part um, has nothing to do with my, my design or my intent or my sensibility. It's, it's, uh, it just is, it, it feels more like a collaboration with nature or with uh, natural phenomenon. So I started to think about this idea of like, this process being somewhat of a, a collaboration with uh, with nature. Um, 
So my drawings, uh, which I've always drawn my entire life, and, and when this process started, um, I kind of stopped uh, <clears throat> designing an aesthetic. I stopped you know, designing an object and how this thing should look, and I started to um, draw uh, kind of uh, these plans of you know, what I could do to you know, give myself the possibility of a good outcome. Um, so, see what happens. <laughs> I, I wrote my a note that says, see what happens. Um, so, this is now years later. Uh, I've, I've really refined the process quite a bit. Um, I'm, the process has become a, a series of tangents. So it's always within the uh, you know production of one piece that I, I'm kind of thinking about the next one. And um, that last drawing was you know a, a thought about you know I have these uh, these vessels which you know I'm filling the cavity full of wax. I'm getting this this horizontal texture because of the you know the wax filling the cavity, um, kind of doing this heat shrink thing on the, on the outside, or this temperature shock on the outside, which creates all of that, uh, that texture. Um, but what if I, you know, took a, a block of ice, hollowed the center out, um, poured wax into it, and then sort of like sloshed it or like rolled it on its side, uh, which I thought might give me a more vertical texture, um, which is what this was here. This was, uh, I think, one of the, the pieces I was doing for Carpenters more recently. But um, this is uh, the effect um, of this, this rotational sort of variation on the ice casting process. So um, I'm really you know, refining more, um, uh, understanding exactly what temperature the wax needs to be exactly what temperature the, the ice needs to be. Um, I realized that um, really hot wax, like 250 degree wax, um, and really cold ice, like negative 10 degree ice, is far different than 200 degree wax and you know kind of melty 10 degree ice. Um, so I, I found this this sweet spot uh, where you can you know, pour this almost solidifying wax into, you know, almost water melting ice and you get this super dramatic texture and these places where, you know, the bronze could be polished and uh, you get like bigger surface area. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, so this is um, ice cast bronze vessel number two. Um, in silver nitrate, um, this is one of the one of the bigger pieces. So obviously, I, I always want to get like larger and larger. This was really pushing the boundaries of, you know, what they're able to cast in one shot. And um, so we're working with, uh, you know, refining the form, um, you know, making the scale. Um, larger and you know experimenting with some different uh, patinas and things uh, and I don't know why everything starts with vessels for me but everything starts with vessels I think it's just like an object that is of a scale that has sort of a, um, it, it's very basic it only has to I mean, it doesn't really even have to work. A vase can be something that's just uh, beautiful, that just sits, sits on a mantle, um, or it could, you know, hold flowers or something. But uh, I wanted to, you know, move beyond vessels also and get more into furniture. So uh, more, more drawings um, of, you know, possible ways that I could produce furniture pieces. Um, Those, those drawings would, would uh, be somewhat accurate in the way that I would produce these. Um, something like this is a uh, more recent piece, but is produced in uh, several parts. So the legs are uh, produced separately and then kind of spliced in, in wax. And 
or cast separately in bronze and then um, assembled. But uh, so the top of this piece is hollow um, and this is called the ice cast bronze or the ICB cavern drink table for Carpenter's Workshop. So this is kind of uh, after some experimentation with uh, this first casting method and then this second rotational um, casting method. Um, I went back to the original to, you know, uh, investigate another um, form, another category of uh, object. And um, I... I, at some point, I purchased uh, an ice cream freezer off of Craigslist or something. I was st like a little guy, and then uh, I got like a big, massive chest freezer, uh, which I would use to, which we saw in the one video, I would use to freeze massive blocks of ice, which I could work in. Um, I'd get these big troughs, which I could fill with uh, water and freeze over, so I would have a big slab that I could work on year-round. But um, what I ended up coming back back around to was uh, working outdoors, which was kind of the genesis of the entire project in the first place. Um, and it was also, it felt, um, it just felt more natural. Um, it felt like I was actually in that collaboration with the elements. Um, I, was, I was outdoors doing this thing and um, I was feeling like, you know, closer to earth, closer to nature, kind of like really in this, um, this, uh, this, uh, in concert with, with the elements. So, um, and I started to have ideas about like this studio becoming a seasonal, um, a seasonal studio or something like that. Like I, I produce ice cast bronze pieces in the winter when the, um, the, natural environment provides the opportunity and the rest of the year maybe I supplement with with something else just a thought um, but maybe someday that that's in the future but um, I, I I love the idea of uh, these temporary like ephemeral conditions kind of passing through uh, creating an opportunity um, to create something which is then made permanent in, in bronze. Um, and that's kind of the big idea for me. Also working outdoors is, uh, it allows me to work at a different scale. So, you know, freezers only come yay big until I get myself a room-sized walk-in or something like that. But um, I, I think outdoors uh, is, is best. So, um, that rooftop that I was on, that's it's out the window of my current studio, uh, and I would set up a sprinkler out there um, and uh, just like ice it over. And this is something out of my childhood um, living in Michigan playbook where we would go in the backyard and we would make this, um, this thing out of plywood and two by fours and we'd stomp the snow down, pack it down, and then you'd put the sprinkler out there and you know, uh, water it down and let it ice over overnight and you keep putting the water on and you make yourself a, a backyard skating rink, which we did when, when we were kids. And so we did that um, on the rooftop and in, in the parking lot. And, uh, and that, was, that was fun too. It was just like being a kid again and, and, and playing. Um, and playing is why I got into art in the first place. Um, so these are some of the, the waxes, um, older pieces that uh, I had just poured on the rooftop. Um, with this one, uh, you can see that it, it's sort of directional. Um, it kind of moves in one direction, and that's because it's a gentle grade to the, the rooftop. So, you know, rainfall comes down, everything goes to one side, and, you know, the water um, goes down the spout. And uh, so I realized that and thought, to myself, huh, I could maybe use this, but um, maybe at other times I would rather have just like a flat surface. So I started to 
you know, buy kiddie pools and things like that, like um, backyard swimming pools that I would cut down. I would put a couple inches of water into, let them freeze over. It's self-leveling, um, which would allow me to pour onto a, a flat surface um, like this one. And it's one more. So uh, based on the waxes that I'm just getting, um, I s I'm starting to think about like how these pieces um, work their way into some sort of object. Uh, some of the waxes are just really interesting on their own. Um, another idea I had was to, you know, create a form and take one of these directional waxes, which has all these these fingers and uh, all that beautiful texture and in, in the holes and the sort of lacy feeling to it and, and heat it up um, in this big kind of easy bake oven that I built in the studio for this purpose, uh, get it to a point where it's kind of noodly and I would lay it over the form and uh, produce uh, a, an object that way. So um, this is uh, ICB lace vessel number two. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, this is something which is really not, not functional. Um, the previous cocktail tables you saw were, um, you know, semi-functional. Um, you could probably put a tray on there and maybe put a drink on that, but uh, functionality has never been really paramount for, for me, for my work. Um, even back to my sculpture days, I, I wanted, I thought about furniture not because um, I was necessarily interested in, in uh, you know, making people's butts feel good when they sit down or whatever, um, or making something that makes life more efficient or whatever. I, I was thinking about like, I like the idea of my objects being in the home. Um, I didn't like the, uh, the precious nature of sculpture and that I was seeing. Um, I liked the idea of people touching my work and people having an actual um, physical, you know, um, intimate relationship with it. That sounds weird. Um, you know, I want people to touch the work and, um, you know, not, not be precious about it, uh, which is another reason that I, I like bronze. Um, the old, you know, worn bronze that's been handled is, is beautiful and all, all of that age and everything just makes the piece even, even better. So, um, uh, moving forward with the, the idea of, of working outdoors and working with nature, I, I had this idea like pretty early on when I started to develop this process and doing the, the rotational casting. Um, I wanted to do it inside a, a snowball. It just made sense to me. A snowball was another thing that, you know, you do when you're a kid in, in Michigan and you, you got a lot of snowfall. I, I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then went to college in Holland. So we always got, you know, a lot of snowfall over there. And um, uh, this piece required uh, like perfect conditions. And in Chicago, we don't get so much snowfall. We just get like some pretty frigid temperatures. But I waited for um, three years for the, the the weather to be perfect for this thing. So I needed a lot of snowfall. I needed uh, uh, three or four days after that to actually uh, make, a, make a snowball, um, ice it over because you can't pour against snow. It just looks gross. Um, I needed to uh, kind of spray it down with water, um, uh, leave it overnight for a couple days, uh, let it really ice over. And uh, it worked out perfectly. Um, and I guess this was 2018, maybe. Um, so in my backyard, uh, when winter presented the, um, the conditions, I went out there with an assistant of mine. I built this, made this four foot snowball. I carved the center out. Um, I was out there with a hose and like a, you know, a box fan. Uh, neighbors probably thought I was insane. 
um, for a couple nights, and on the, the third day, it was, it was like ready to go. So I, I poured in about 50 pounds of um, hot casting wax. And uh, this is the piece in the backyard. So, um, yeah, so we poured this uh, into the snowball, and then um, we just rolled it. Uh, really slowly, just like a couple inches at a time until uh, the snowball did a full rotation and, you know, the wax coated the entire inside of the snowball. And then this is the uh, hot water for the reveal at the end. But uh, working at this scale um, provided a lot of uh, really interesting problems. You know, there's so much wax in there and it's so much weight that once you get around to, you know, um, the 180 degrees from where you started, all that wax weight is going to want to just like fall in on itself. Um, and so those little red pieces there, uh, I figured out the hard way that I had to like tie into, you know, the side of this thing. So I froze those pieces in, uh, the wax, um, kind of moved around it, secured itself to the wall of this snowball, and then um, we were able to make a, a rotation with that wax. And so this is the ICB um, snowball, number one. So uh, this was a massive piece. It's about 250 pounds finished, and we had to produce it in four parts. So you know, separating the piece in locations where we could weld it back together without making it, you know, terrible looking was a challenge. And, uh, you know, just there was like a couple weeks of wax work, just pulling out um, wax from wherever I could to, is to not add like a ton of weight in there. Um, That's the piece in silver nitrate finish. We've only uh, produced a, a prototype of, of that. Um, but uh, so this is more, um, you know, filling up my kiddie pools on the roof uh, a couple of years ago. Um, whenever winter is, uh, provides the opportunity, I'm, I'm outside, uh, pouring waxes, kind of like just compiling, uh, pieces, um, experimenting with, uh, different ways to, um, different ways to pour, uh, different ways to, um, uh, just lay out pieces. I, I started to produce these, you know, flat parts, these flat segments, um, for tabletops of, um, the cocktail table before, and, and I started to pour um, pieces that would become uh, mirror frames. So the texture on these feels a lot more refined than, you know, the, uh, the waxes that I was showing earlier. Um, and that's just because I've, I've like really dialed in all those, you know, those, the temperatures and, um, how exactly to pour, and uh, at, at this point, um, it's it's really feeling good. Uh, except, what's interesting is that like I I started wanting to design you know furniture and sculpture and whatever, and I had this completely different idea uh, about what that would look like, and um, I got into this process, and I. Um, I kind of relinquish control a little bit to to just the elements, um, and that's part of what I really love about the the process. It's it's um, I I kind of create a framework and then let the the process kind of uh, finish itself. Um, and what that means sometimes is that um, it starts to look, you know, th these pieces start to look kind of decorative to me. There's like these. Uh, these sort of like rosebud, um, like bloom-like things, which uh, was never something that was in my, um, you know, 
my aesthetic vocabulary. I didn't really love that, but I think that it's more important to uh, follow where the work leads, at least with this uh, particular uh, body of work, uh, just let that kind of like drive it. So um, that is, that's the plan moving forward. Uh, but this, this piece is a, a mirror, um, it's pretty large scale, it's about five foot by four foot, um, ICB freeform mirror, uh, number one for Carpenter's Workshop Gallery. Uh, I called it freeform mirror. Um, all, all the naming of my pieces, um, I kind of just call them what they are. Uh, ICB is always ice cast bronze. Um, and then there's some sort of reference to the the variation of the process, the method, um, and this is free form. This is, means that I'm just sort of like pouring free form onto the ice and the wax goes, goes where it, wherever it will. Um, <clears throat> and more recently, I've uh, kind of kicked off another tangent that I've been thinking about for a little while. Um, I'm calling it kudzu and I'll explain that in a minute. But this is, uh, you know, very similar, but it's um, uh, a kind of a different method of, of pouring um, and to create a little bit different outcome. When I'm pouring like something like tabletops or some of the parts for the mirror, um, the larger flat pieces are the ones that tend to be more difficult to cast. There's always, there's not always, but there's sometimes problems with the, you know, the ceramic shell uh, expanding or, you know, blowing out. And um, I started to think about also wanting to, to work larger, but kind of uh, getting around that, uh, that problem of those large flats. So I wanted to, th I was thinking about different ways that I could produce like smaller elements and then uh, put them together, assemble them. Um, and this is an idea for uh, just a, a wall installation, um, just a drawing. But after I started pouring in that way, I started to get those pieces like I held up on the, the rooftop there. And um, they started to remind me of this, this, this organic blanket, this kind of uh, vine-like um, covering or something, um, which made me think about being in Atlanta. Um, and uh, interesting at the time, I coming from the Midwest and, and going down there, um, I saw kudzu for the first time. And kudzu is this invasive vine species, which we do not have in the north, but was all over down there. And it was um, shocking to see. Uh, you would kind of drive everywhere in Atlanta, and you would come across these landscapes like this that were um, just bright green and these these sort of ghostly forms um, coming out and I was perplexed by this at first but um, you know found out that this is this is like kudzu it's it's a vine species that just grows at an incredible rate it's actually illegal to have on your property down there but you just like if it starts it, you can't stop it so um, this makes this beautiful landscape, and I would walk by places like this, and you could see kind of the outline of a, a little shed or something, and uh, it's just completely covered uh, by this blanket of green. And then these other um, things are just like trees that uh, the kudzu has just grown over. So it, it's beautiful, but it's also... Um, it, the kudzu is actually just like blocking out the light from everything underneath. So it'll grow over the top of an entire forest and basically just kill everything underneath it um, by just, you know, suffocating it uh, from, from light. Um, so kind of a weird thing, but you, you would often see these, um, I don't know, things like this, that maybe that's a tree or sometimes there was like a power line that kind of, uh, the kudzu overtook and it produced these like crazy forms and um, it was like you know the natural environment just kind of mashing into um, the built environment 
and uh, when you s you can see like the outline of a shed, but it's kind of like um, uh, weird and strange looking and green. And um, so I started thinking about the the bronze um, just uh, as a way uh, kudzu as as a a way to think about formatting the bronze, like. If I create this this sort of lattice of, of parts and I can create them in smaller elements, um, casting becomes easier. I can then assemble them at uh, any scale, basically. Um, and always wanted to scale up. I wanted to make like larger uh, s pieces for storage, um, pieces that were more like intrinsic to architecture itself, so like a, a door or gates, or um, this was a reception desk idea, uh, the uh, spiral staircase. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in, in it, this, uh, the ability to, to produce this work at, uh, it, at that kind of like um, site-specific uh, scale architectural scale. Um, and more recently, uh, I got the opportunity to put a small show together in New York at uh, E.R. Butler uh, Company, which is uh, a company that produces high-end uh, drawer hardware, drawer pulls, doorknobs, things like that. Um, they have this beautiful, like, four window bays in Soho. And um, I kind of just cold called them <laughs> And I was introduced by a friend, but just uh, three days later, we had decided we we're going to have a show. And I thought this was a great opportunity to, you know, do some smaller pieces that um, kind of show the opportunity within this kudzu ice cast bronze idea that I had. So um, this is a side table, um, ICB kudzu side table number one, in uh, like an ox bl blood patina. Um, which my friend Sal did. I thought he might even be here. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a, a fireplace screen. Um, and this is just sort of a satin kind of raw bronze, wax bronze finish. Uh, and then I wanted to do some lighting. I've never gotten into lighting with the ice cast bronze process and I've, uh, um, I think there's some opportunity there also. So um, this is sort of similar to the uh, ice cast bronze lace vessel from before where I'm creating a form, I'm making these wax elements, I'm heating them up, I'm you know creating the piece full scale, uh, forming the waxes around uh, these jigs and then you know taking them apart for casting and uh, so this is a finished um, ice cast bronze uh, kudzu pendant with a uh, green patina so the the there's like a ball a globe in the center and this my bronze sort of like drapes and uh, falls over the side, um, and this is the table lamp version of that. Um, this was last year uh, up in Lake Charlevoix. Uh, I, I've had an idea for a long time and have uh, talked a little bit with the, the gallery about possibly doing a, a solo show or something like that where I where it actually becomes uh, an expedition into nature and it could be at this lake this is a, a a lake in northern Michigan where I've I've gone camping every year of my entire life um, and so has my mother and uh, her parents as a state park up there called Young State Park um, I, I love this place it's kind of special to me and in the winter, it freezes solid. So you can, uh, you can walk all the way across the lake. People are um, skiing, ice fishing, just like driving uh, their quads out there. Um, and it's, it's really amazing. But the entire lake is like feet of ice. So 
um, on a whim, I went up there with a friend of mine, and we, you know, walked around for a long time until we found uh, a location that we could pour a couple uh, mirror frames. So uh, I've got, you know, a couple waxes that aren't yet made in bronze, but these are these these unique pieces that were made um, in a you know a certain time and place, and one that's special for me and. Um, as I, you know, think more and more about the, the ice cast bronze process, um, it's, it's, uh, in, you know, if as artists we are, um, you know, the, the note takers of culture and, um, where we're kind of like documenters, um, these, these pieces for me become uh, kind of a, stime, a time stamp of a, a certain place and time, and um, especially this piece. Uh, and bronze itself um, in the, the lost wax process is something that's, uh, you know, millennia old. It's, it's, they're, they've unearthed pieces that are thousands of years old, and, and that process is, you know, uh, pretty much unchanged from the one that we're using today. Uh, I think that's really interesting about uh, the material, it's, it's permanence. So um, early on being an artist, I, I always loved the idea of, of legacy, like these pieces um, having a life beyond my own and you know, being, making something really special which is um, you know, bought and sold and handed down and uh, it, it, uh, it kind of just is around forever. Um, and these, these pieces, I'm thinking more about that legacy. Um, like, I want to do this ex, you know, expedition out into uh, the elements and use you know, various uh, techniques that I've developed in the ice cast bronze, you know, the rolling of the snowball and doing the rotational casting and this, um, these flat freeform pours and the kudzu and uh, um, digging into uh, the surface of this lake and, you know, creating this, uh, I call this the cavern pieces. Um, but I, I, I think it's, uh, there's a, a unique opportunity to create like a, maybe a small body of work uh, in that way and it would be, you know, of a certain time and place. And, you know, maybe in the future this won't even be possible in, in this location. Maybe it won't freeze over in Chicago anymore. Um, but uh, those pieces will, will uh, be there to remind us of, uh, of a different time. Um, my, um, okay, hard, hard switch. <laughs> uh, resin bonded sand. Uh, uh, my other process that I've been developing, less time than the ice cast bronze, but uh, um, as a result of working with the foundry and working with uh, bronze casting, I, bonded sand was always around. It's um, an investment material, a refractory material that they, you know, pack onto pattern boards and then, uh, and then they're, they put them together and pour bronze into them. And, uh, and then when it's, done, they'll break the sand off and kind of throw it in the dumpster. It's a, it's a temporary material, it's cheap, it's a byproduct. Um, but so I, I, being around the foundry, I would kind of pick up little chunks off the floor and it had this really interesting feel, this uh, consistency where you could kind of scratch it with your fingernail and uh, it, would, it would shed, but it was, um, had enough integrity that it would stay together and you could kind of carve forms out of it and it wouldn't fall apart. So um, I, you know, I was pack ratting some of this stuff in my, my studio and playing with it here and there, tinkering. Uh, and one day I had some resin that I was using for something else, I can't remember what, and I, uh, painted a few surfaces of one of these pieces and let it soak in and cure. Um, and after that, I was able to uh, carve away the, the uncured uh, resin bonded sand and leaving only that shell, which is, uh, you know, now this, this structural textured object. So I started to 
you know, experiment more, develop different ways of, of texturing. Um, something like this was just uh, repeated hitting with a wire brush, like hammering with the bristles of a wire brush, um, and pulling out these, these spines. Um, again, like starting with the vessel form, um, and then kind of wanting to move on to larger pieces, furniture, other sculptural objects. Um, so I started to order just from the foundry, just like a solid block of sand. So this is like a five or 600 pound block of bonded sand. Um, that would just produce a box and put it down there and, uh, and then pick it up. Um, and I got this, this pristine, perfect block up into my studio and I walked around it for a few days and I had no idea how to like get into this. Like I, I, I started making drawings and plans and, uh, and ended up just kind of deciding to take a, a play out of the Ice Cast Bronze playbook, which was to just, just start hacking at it and doing some experiments. It's not the end of the world if, uh, you know, this, this sand, um, is a waste, but um, I did, I was started doing some research also. And also uh, something that kind of dawned on me um, that um, worked with some of the ideas of, of the ice cast bronze process, this sort of man and nature and um, this, uh, you know, working in tandem together. Um, uh, what I found these, these cave dwellings. This is one that's in China. Um, and there was, there's several others around the world that um, Afghanistan and Turkey and uh, places where there's not a lot of documentation, but uh, I just have to assume that like some people uh, needed shelter, found that they could tunnel into this sandstone material and uh, create some shelter for themselves. So, um, I'm assuming they, they kind of started in one location, they tunneled into it. Uh, that gave them a doorway, a, a few walls and a ceiling, um, and maybe they wanted to expand a little bit more, more room. Uh, and, you know, they kept moving and maybe their neighbor moves in next door and they wanna have a little uh, walkway between and they want some light so they carve a window and they use this entirely subtractive process uh, to uh, create a volume of space where they can actually dwell in. Um, and <clears throat> that, that for me was like the, the, the perfect um, uh, starting point. I would just enter at one place and move through the material. I would treat it like um, a small piece of architecture. I would make walls, ceilings, floors, um, doorways, um, and this is one of the, the first resin bonded sand uh, furniture pieces. It was a, a console, it's actually laying on its back here, but it's started as a 1200 pound block of bonded sand, um, which I used uh, like a straight die grinder and a, a rasp bit, which is something I originally bought for carving ice. Um, and I used that to carve through the sand, which I found that it just like plows through sand, just cuts through it like butter. Uh, at least when the, the bits are sharp, um, it kills bits like, like nothing else. It's one of the biggest expenses with this, this, uh, um, this process. But um, so I'm just like removing material and in, in leaving all parts that uh, would become console or, or whatever. Um, uh, and I just envisioned like a small person kind of uh, passing through this this piece. Um, so there's these little kind of passageways, uh, um, doors, and uh, uh, yeah, so th there's actually a way that you can kind of, if you are a little tiny person, that you could go from the top of this thing down through and get all the way to, to the bottom, to the floor. So the front was carved first, and then uh, resined and allowed to cure so it becomes uh, structural and then picked up and carved the back next so the whole back looks the same. 
And this was still really uh, pretty early in experimentation, but uh, you know, somebody came in my studio, uh, Commune Design, when they were uh, designing the, and um, Balling Gallery also, and they were uh, working on the Ace Hotel in Chicago. And they asked me if I could produce, they saw that piece, they asked me if I could produce uh, a DJ booth in this material. And I said, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> I had no idea uh, what I was doing really still, but um, I said yes, and I think sometimes you have to just throw yourself into uh, things like that and, and try and figure it out. So um, we had this uh, project to design or create this DJ booth, which was, I think, a eight or nine feet long by, I don't know, five feet deep and had to hold uh, audio equipment and speakers. Um, so we just kind of uh, went after it. Um, I can also add pigments to the resin once I, you know, I, uh, paint the resin onto the sand when it soaks in, I can add uh, pigments at that time and you know turn the entire block that color um, just a little bit carving so that's one of those rasp bits they come in different uh, different sizes uh, ended up talking with the company that produces these ones and they would make custom ones for me at different um, dimensions and uh, there's the DJ booth Looks like a big uh, birthday cake or something. Um, so uh, still very much in its uh, experimental stage. Um, I'm, I'm still drawing this whole time and, and kind of drawing my little comic strip uh, images of, you know, what I would plan to do, hoping for, you know, a good result. This was one thing. Um, that I had tried. This is a, a bonded sand block, and then um, I took a like a core drill and drilled vertical holes uh, at different bearing depths down through the top, almost all the way to the bottom. And we're uh, borrowing another um, piece from the ice cast bronze process, which is this like pool kids squirt gun thing, which I turned into like a giant syringe um, to inject resin into each of the holes and then pull it out so the resin goes in, um, soaks in, soaks outward from the inside and then uh, once that's cured, um, it goes into a sand blaster and we're blasting away uh, the brittle sand from the outside. So um, in a similar way as the ice cast bronze uh, comes out, it's it's sort of uh, a reveal at the end where, you know, I don't know exactly what this piece is going to look like until I excavate it from uh, the center of this block. Um, but this was a prototype, one of the first um, uh, pieces like this. The this is the RBS core uh, side table, and then continuing with that idea um, of carving the inside and soaking uh, resin from the inside out, um, I decided to make a vessel in, in a similar way. So um, this was the first one of my uh, RBS bubble vessels. Uh, and this was sort of a, a result of uh, that company that I had mentioned um, offering me these rasp bits that were uh, you know, these ball, these perfect spheres, and I could carve these perfect spheres into, into the sand. So I started to just do that and, and make larger ones. And, uh, and then I couldn't get them to make like a ball that was like six or eight inches uh, in diameter. So I, I started to make my own tools, uh, which I ended up creating in the same material, so I would use resin bonded sand, make a sphere, cure it, and that then became like a sanding tool to sand the sand. So we'll s see that in a minute. I'm just gonna let this one roll for a second.
when I post things like this, I often get people reaching out and saying, hey, I wanna, can I, you know, you looking for interns? This looks really fun. <laughs> and um, I always laugh because it's, uh, the fun ends like uh, on day one, halfway <laughs> through the day. It's, um, it's, a, it's pretty brutal work when you're tunneling through a, a block of sand like that. Um, that's that rasp bit. Um, but I'm continuous, uh, continuously uh, engineering, kind of re-engineering the process to make it easier, to make it, um, you know, better to make the the pieces, uh, this some of the bonded sand sanding balls, um, and I made them from you know two inches to uh, up to like six inches, so I could then sand uh, these perfect spheres into the inside of this block. So here we are in our hazmat suits. Um, the original uh, resin that I used was something I was using for um, something else, and it was not good. Uh, it, it yellowed immediately. Um, there was a couple pieces I had to kind of recall and fix or remake. Um, ended up finding this uh, this really gross urethane, but which is just so so much better. Um, so it's uh, this part of the process is not uh, it, it, it's pretty dirty also. Um, so once the we resin the inside, it soaks outwards into the block. Um, this one had kind of a two tone color thing, which I sponged uh, one color onto the tops of those points on the inside, and then went over with a whole uh, coat over the entire surface, uh, which gives you this kind of. Um, you know, this, this uh, two-tone thing. Um, and moving on, I'm, my time is almost up here, but uh, this uh, was a, an image I found in, you know, the far reaches of the internet somewhere. Um, and I have been obsessed with this, this, this space where, um, you know, the built environment uh, intersects with uh, the, the natural environment. And, um, you know, humans tunneling into the side of a cliff to, you know, make a home for themselves. And uh, in the same way, you know, there's this story here where, you know, some kids are playing basketball near the ocean, somebody airballs it, and, you know, this ball is gone forever, and then it becomes this sort of uh, floating apartment building for, you know, these million little mollusks down here um, and I, I, I just kind of love that. Um, so I started looking into and researching, you know, places where, um, uh, yeah, just uh, the built environment intersects with nature. So like the bottom of a, a pier where there's pilings and then, you know, all these, these creatures start um, creating homes and uh, at the same time, developing new processes um, of producing uh, these works. So I, I started making these kind of barnacle-like forms. Um, and again, this is uh, every resin bonded sand piece is, is a subtractive process. So it's um, this is entirely made of of one piece. There's no additive parts. Um, so uh, the interior is carved. Uh, the interior is soaked with resin. It's cured. Um, and then the outside is carved to a point and then drilled to create the holes and then resin the inside of each one of the holes, uh, which secure themselves to the inner form. And then I sandblast away um, everything that was left. So it's a selective um, curing and uh, this is more of that, you know, uh, bottom of the, the pier barnacle. So using, you know, those ideas to drive the form, you know, the pilings, the, um, uh, these kind of weird orifices that, that feel like they're uh, of a, um, you know, a sea creature, um, kind of look like suction cups or something. Um, yeah, just looking to nature for some of uh, that 
um, those clues as to how to uh, create new forms. Um, and uh, this was another one where uh, cactuses for me were, were another thing. I'm working with all this sand. My studio is filling up with sand. I'm, I start to envision like this, um, this, this photo opportunity where these, there's these like cactuses in, in my space in, inside of this desert which I've created uh, by making all this other work. And um, thinking about the sand as a material being that it is a refractory material, it's something that's meant to take a lot of heat. It's meant to, to burn, you know, they pour bronze into it. Um, I thought maybe I could uh, hand carve a blow mold and we could actually blow glass into it. So that's, that's what I did. Uh, the, the two blocks here are these quartered blocks, which are then carved um, and, and then we'll blow glass into the sand. So it's, um, the, the sand takes a lot of heat, obviously. It burns. It's more, more of that, that binder that's burning, which is kind of gross, but it's formulated to, to do just that. And um, I'm, you know, blowing these kind of cactus-like forms, that, which would become a, a light diffuser. Uh, it's kind of one quarter of one of the blow molds. But um, these pieces are, are something that came about. And uh, what I think is interesting about these is that you know the bases are created in the resin bonded sand material as you know a permanent um, uh, material that makes up the base, and then the tops are uh, mouth blown into the same material. So the the resin bonded sand is um, you know part of the piece and part means to create the piece. Um, and kind of continuing on the, the cactus idea. Um, this is a, a Christmas cactus. Uh, my grandfather passed away uh, in 2019, 18. Um, anyways, he, he and my grandmother were gifted a, a Christmas cactus on their wedding. Um, they were married for 69 years um, and uh, my grandfather passed away and this Christmas cactus was still uh, alive. <laughs> and um, the, the dirt inside that pot was like cement and we took a cutting and each of us took these and were able to propagate uh, another plant. And I don't know if this, this little cactus kind of, you know, um, subconsciously rooted in my brain or something, but uh, this, this chandelier was uh, created as, as a, uh, after looking at, you know, cactuses like that and how they branch and how they, they form. Um, so um, this is some of the most recent uh, resin bonded sand work. So um, these chandeliers uh, are, you know, the, kind of a kit of parts in there. They're this scalable object. There's these central body elements, and then there's these lamp housings, which are, you know, all the same material, um, you know, all hand sculpted, hand uh, carved. This, this is like a wire brushed uh, directional um, carving, uh, which is then, you know, resined. Um, and yeah, it's um, it's been a really fun one to, to uh, work on these and, you know, quote some like larger installation pieces. So these can have, you know, a horizontal format and they can grow this direction, but they could also be hung differently and uh, take a, a vertical uh, format. So um, I think that is my last slide, but um, I, yeah, just the, the resin bonded sand and the, the ice cast bronze um, are processes that uh, I didn't I didn't know uh, ten years ago that uh, this was the kind of work that I was going to do. But it, it it did 
sort of occur to me somewhere in the middle that this is um, what was resonating with me and the people that uh, follow my work. And I just, um, I love the, the idea of um, creating a, a process, you know, thinking about the process in hopes of creating an object. And uh, instead of this like design build format where I'm designing a, um, an aesthetic and then trying to like force somebody or myself to figure out exactly how to, uh, you know, um, nail the, the uh, production of this piece. Um, and that is, uh, I think, the, the thing in my work which is, um, continues to, you know, follow through, um, whether it's Ice Cast Bronze or Resin Bonded Sand or um, whatever processes that I'm, I'll come up with in the future. Um, so, uh, I guess that's it. And uh, I hope you liked my work. <laughs> uh, but I... <coughs> Yeah, I'd uh, be happy to take some questions. If questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand. And uh, on one side of the room, please just let us know. This one is perhaps the, the uh, question for the story. Hello. Hi. Um, early on, you mentioned that you sort of didn't, part of what led you to the furniture design is you didn't like the preciousness of sculpture. And I'm wondering how that is, how that aligns with, I guess, using bronze, which is such an expensive and like fine art with a capital A material. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you liked sort of what happened to bronze when it's touched over and over by people, but I guess I'm just wondering how, how are you using such a precious material in a way that is sort of aligning with your desire to create something that is like familiar and approachable? Yeah, I guess, um Thinking about uh, maybe the way I use the word precious, um, yeah, bro the, bro the whole bronze process is expensive, like every aspect of it. It's, uh, the material itself is pretty expensive. It's even gotten more expensive very recently. Um, what's even more expensive is the labor involved, especially with like this type of like art casting, this, um, this casting into ceramic shell, and uh, there's just tons of wax work and then you know degating and grinding and patina work and fine finishing and all that stuff um i you know i'd never really liked bronze before i had the opportunity to just like try it out um and i i wanted to um I didn't, uh, working with, at Holly Hunt before um, this whole like period of my life, um, bronze was sort of like, a, it was always an afterthought. It was like, uh, this, we don't know what to do with this chair leg, let's just uh, cast it in bronze. I don't mean to like disparage Holly Hunt. Um, but um, that's the way I kind of considered bronze. It was a heavy, expensive, kind of uh, fancy material that was fancy because it's fancy. Um, and I, I didn't like that aspect about it, but I, I, I think the way I wanted to um, work with it was, A, I was doing all, all of the work myself because of my sort of access to a foundry. I could um, skip some of the cost of uh, at least a lot of the labor because I would, I would take that on myself and I, I'm doing all of that work. Um, you know, the price of bronze itself and the price of the materials or something, I couldn't get around, but um, I could make pieces, I could make those first pieces um, reasonably cheaply. And um, I think when I was talking about like precious sculpture, I, I was thinking more of, of like pieces that end up in a gallery setting or pieces that end up in a museum that are um, hands off and that are, uh, you know, too, um, that are just, you know, um, you know, do not touch signs everywhere. I just wanted my work to be um, able to be handled and be uh, take age and take some punishment and just like be an object that is used. Um, and I think that's uh, when I started to think about furniture or um, 
you know, kind of my artwork uh, taking the form of furniture as a vehicle to like get sculpture into the home or something like that. Um, I still don't feel like my pieces are precious and I hope people don't think my pieces are precious in the sense that um, they can't handle them and they can't uh, use them. I guess that's what I was kind of meaning. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, that's another reason I want to work with a gallery. Um, I, uh, some of my work, I can't, I can't afford my own work. <laughs> I can't um, afford the production cost of these pieces. Um, but I'm, you know, have so advanced into this, this, uh, this body of work that um, I'm, I need to work through this, this, uh, this tangent, which is ice cast bronze and, uh, um, yeah, it's, it is what it is, I guess. I was, I was hoping that I could um, ask you the, um, maybe it's a sort of classic question of, um, more about uh, your uh, general question about your practice. Um, is there any special ad advice that you would give to a student who wanted to work in the, the world of um, collectible design um, yeah, what's, what's important for a student who wants to take that route in their career? Any, any advice from, from things you've, you've learned or lessons, maybe even lessons you've learned the hard way? Yeah, um, yeah, my, my, uh, work in my career went through a lot of iterations and, uh, I never thought about collectible design as being, like that didn't even, that term didn't exist when I was in sculpture class or even when I was like a, early on as a furniture designer. Um, I kind of found myself in this realm because of um, the work that I naturally progressed towards, which was this, you know, process heavy, um, uh, you know, labor intensive work that was, um, you know, not, uh, typical uh, furniture and in, in that it's like usable and utility is, is paramount. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, um, I guess when we were sitting together and, and talking with students earlier, I was kind of feeling a little bit envious of, of that time of life where it's, um, it, not to say that like nothing matters at that time, but you do have some like extra leeway to experiment and do things that may fail um like there's a good chance that they fail but they they might not and just like really take an opportunity to take those chances while while you can and produce you know you know the the really wild stuff the really high concept stuff or um you know whatever it is um that you want to do um as far as like getting uh, to a point where, you know, I'm creating a paycheck, I, I'm creating a, like an economy uh, with my work. It's um, something that took a lot of years. I mean, I've been doing the ice cast bronze work for uh, 11 years now. Um, and you know, it went nowhere for the first four. Uh, it, uh, I, I sold them through, you know, my old, company, Holly Hunt, who I still had a relationship with, and they would sell some of the smaller pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, I just started small. Um, and I would, I would do a lot of shows in New York, ICFF, and other sort of off-site things like that. I would go to Milan every year. I talked to a lot of people. Um, I got myself into you know, curated shows here and there. Um, uh, I wasn't necessarily looking for representation. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I just networked a lot. I just like, I made work and I tried to show it to a lot of people and that ended up working out. Um, somebody from Carpenters, I think, uh, saw my work in New York when I was showing at Wanted Design. Um, uh, in 2016, I think I got the, the American Design Honors Award uh, and they, gave me a 2,000 square foot space for free and I could just show whatever whatever I wanted. And at that point, I kind of like decided to pull out all the stops. I made the first 
large, larger scale ice cast bronze pieces, the cocktail tables. Um, I showed the first resin modded sand pieces, the, the console and, um, you know, some vessels, a mirror, um, but just all out of pocket, kind of just rubbing a couple nickels together to make a dollar. And uh, I, you know, took a, took a chance. I took a lot of chances and a lot of times I lost my money, but, um, you know, uh, somebody from Carpenter saw my work there and reached out and uh, said, we'd like to talk to you. And, um, you know, maybe a year later after chasing them around the world <laughs> and trying to just showing up at shows uh, to see them, uh, it worked out and, you know, we got a few pieces in the gallery and they sold and then we kind of gradually moved on from there. Um, but it's, you know, it's still, it's still um, a relationship which is, uh, flushing out and we're still kind of, I've been there for five years now um, and we're still uh, getting to know each other and seeing what work works and um, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a process. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, I was just wondering, I know you've done a lot of investigation into the properties of ice, temperatures of ice, different, uh, like the science of, of how you make your process happen. And I also uh, sort of understood you to say that it's a, sort of a site-specific process. Um, it has something to do with the Midwest and the environment here. And so I'm wondering if you have done research into or thought about going to other cold climates that might have different material properties, like Arctic properties. I don't, I don't really know what the science is, but I was wondering if you'd looked into that at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've thought a lot about that, actually, and which, you know, moves to my um, idea of doing this, like, expedition and, you know, producing a piece in a certain location and then maybe showing it there or leaving it there or um, something like that. It just... Um, it just, uh, that's complicated and it takes um, a lot of planning. I've got these ideas about kind of a mobile studio set up too where I can kind of uh, haul all of my gear into like a remote location and do some of these processes and, um, you know, um, maybe stay outdoors or, you know, you know, run my wax pots with car batteries or propane tanks and um, I, I like the idea of that object also, that like, that uh, mobile studio uh, unit. Um, yeah, I, I love I love that idea. I think I just need to to do it the first time, and uh, and yeah, um, going I going all over the world would be incredible. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.